Welcome back, pet parents. So you already know we talk so much about pet food, and there's a reason for that. It is the foundation of health. The food you put in your pet's body is the building block that everything else builds on top of. The nutrition that we give our pets is so critical. We say it all the time. You cannot out supplement a bad diet. So we're talking about pet food again today, but today's actually going to be like really different for you guys because I know that we need to meet people where they are. And I know that we live in a society where everything is about convenience. It's the number one pushback that I get from anyone, anywhere on social media. If I'm talking to a client, they need, they're, they're conditioned. You're probably conditioned to the convenience of dry food. And I get that. And it's hard to find any sort of dried food that is con- keeping that convenience, but also providing real nutrition for a strong foundation of health for your pet, which is why when I think of dry food, I think, okay, what are the two categories where we could actually build a healthy diet? And that would be freeze-dried and air-dried. So today, I am I'm really, really excited to have on Jaron Lucas. He is the CEO and founder of Yum Wolf which is an air dried dog food brand. He's also the author of the canine cocoa mega effect, which we will be talking about today, um, exploring 170, 70, ugh, I can't say that. I'm going to have to edit that, which explores 162 studies on which fats are linked to a longer lifespan in dogs. I am fascinated by fats. I talk about fats a lot. Um, and so I'm really, really interested, Jaren, to talk to you more about fats and our pets. So really quickly, if you are new here, my name is Jessica. I am a certified canine nutritionist and holistic pet health coach, as well as a positive reinforcement dog trainer. So on the Pet Parenting Reset, that's what we talk about. We talk about all the ways in which to be proactive and preferably holistic in taking care of your pets so that they are happy and healthy for life. So welcome to the Pet Parenting Reset, Jaren. Thank you so much for being here. Yeah, thanks so much, Jessica. It's uh, fun to be here uh, chatting with you again. You know, it's weird. It's uh, it's almost like in the mid-1900s, a bunch of corporations came out and uh, convinced us all that dry kibble is um, the healthiest thing for our dog, which is, uh, you know, clearly not true. Um, you know, we, we at Yum Wolf, like, our quickest success stories are always the ones where people switch off of dry kibble, usually recommended by their vet, unfortunately, but Hills, uh, you know, like maybe to name one of my least favorite brands, yeah. you know, it, uh, <laughs> I mean, you know, first we just got to look at the ingredients, but what uh, a lot of people don't realize. And, and in fact, it even took me two years in the industry to really recognize, like a lot of us know that dry kibble is made through this hot extrusion cooking process. And we always talk about how it grinds all the nutrients down on, you know, on just like the, the smallest, you know, microscopic levels of the food. And it kind of like makes intuitive sense that like, okay, highly processed food is going to be really bad. But what it took me two years to really figure out why dogs who switch to pretty much any natural diet, fresh food, air dried, freeze dried, anything but dry kibble like the a question could be why is it that dogs switching off of dry kibble do so much better and it occurred to me after two years that it's actually because this high heat that's used in the hot extrusion process and high pressure is oxidizing the fats turning them into free radicals and so you know if you just like anyone do a deep dive on on free radicals like there is uh, absolutely no debate that those are harmful molecules for any biological organ, uh, any biological being. So whether it be humans or dogs, those are going to be stealing electrons from cells in uh, in the body, ultimately causing faster aging, inflammation, um, all the bad things that we're trying to avoid. So. Yeah, it's unfortunate that um, so many people are still feeding dry kibble, um, and it's even more unfortunate that so many people, when their dogs do have health issues, are being recommended it. 
uh, just because those are like, you know, maybe the, the things that people have known about the longest and have been instructed to say, oh, okay, well, if your dog is uh, having digestive issues, here's the digestive formula that uh, we can put your, your dog on and, and also this medicine. You know, there's there's a much simpler way, and one one thing that I always um, kind of comment to people that I speak to is, you can take the even if those ingredients were good, which in Hills particularly they're not, but there are lots of other brands uh, of dry kibble that have reasonably okay ingredients. Um, you can take those same ingredients, put them into a more fresh diet that is more minimally processed, avoid the grinding of the nutrients avoid the oxidation of fats. Um, this is like really where my book starts. Um, you know, we really talk about like why that problem is so fundamental. So I, I really agree with you in what you said about, we got to start with the foundation, like rounding out the top people, you know, we do have, uh, like supplements for these things, but I always tell pet parents, those are going to help. Like those are like five to 10% improvements. But if we don't get to the bottom of it, the foundational nutrition diet, that's like, nothing's really going to get better until we address that. So yeah, nutrition is super important. Um, you know, I think like I became passionate about, uh, health and nutrition for both humans and dogs. When I learned that all of my skin allergies, uh, were actually food allergies and, doctors had been uh, prescribing me, you know, worse and worse corticosteroids and stuff like that, which work for a little bit until they don't. And then your symptoms come back 10 times worse and you need mm -hmm. even, you know, more and more intense uh, remedies. So once I learned that I personally just need to not eat certain foods, eggs, nuts, and seeds in my case, and I'm totally fine, that like really opened my eyes. So I ended up doing this deep dive of 3000 clinical studies that, um, tied, uh, in particular, when it came to canines, it tied certain ingredients to, uh, health outcomes in dogs, particularly I focus on microbiome diversity, which is, uh, you know, a very new, uh, area of science that interests me a lot because the more and more we learn about the microbiome, it's like guiding our whole body. Um, you know, like 95% of serotonin in the body, for instance, is uh, in the microbiome. So when people talk about just like little things like that, it's like, okay, well, serotonin, you know, matters in the brain, but like, where is the majority of it? It's actually in the gut. So more and more research we're finding uh, really shows that microbiome diversity as like a biomarker for health is uh, unanimously linked to longevity, lower disease, uh, even things like diabetes and and obesity, which are inflammatory um, uh, type of health conditions, a lot of people don't realize that. All those things are uh, you know tied back to the microbiome and and the ingredients that we're putting in our or our dog's body. Really glad you brought up the high heat processing because that really is one of the biggest problems with uh, just the standard kibble diet. Um, as you said, and I, I also wanted to go back to something else you mentioned at the beginning, um, when you were getting into and trying to figure out what, what really is the issue? What really is the problem? And it, it sparked a memory for me not too long ago. I was talking to Dr. Kathy Alanovi and, um, she, we were kind of just discussing the similarities in our, our practices because she gave up her license so that she could actually practice the way she wanted to practice and actually help patients to heal and thrive. Whereas, you know, in standard traditional veterinary medicine, like they, they have to follow these check boxes and you can't do or say these things. And it kind of went back to, she was like, I, or I was talking about how I, I, for a lot of my clients, I feel this like obligation to provide them with recipes that are balanced to AFCO standards. And not necessarily 100% of my clients, because there are certainly people out there who are more well-versed in holistic health and follow all of the holistic veterinarians and understand that um, balance can come through rotation, which is actually how we achieve it in the wild and all the things. But for the a lot of my clients, I'm like, how do we achieve balance? You know, I have to, I have to give them AFCO balanced recipes. And she's like, 
but why do you think that? Who told you that? And I'm like, I don't know, me, maybe, I guess. And she's like, you know who told you that? AFCO told you that, right? Like it's AFCO that put all these standards out that all of these states have adopted that, and they have just done such a good job at like brainwashing us that every meal that our pets eat have to be completely balanced to this set of standards that they, this one organization came up with. It's so crazy. And I just wanted to say that. I don't know why I wanted to say that. <laughs> no, I totally feel you. And uh, there there are a couple of interesting things there. First off, uh, you know, definitely no hate to AFCO. All of our recipes are, are uh, complete and balanced for all life stages, yeah. uh, according to AFCO dog food nutrient profiles. But, you know, there are a few things that I've learned that um, really might kind of hint that like those feeding guidelines aren't necessarily super science backed. Um, mm -hmm. First off, if you look at a lot of the uh, like vitamin D levels and stuff like that, um, not saying those are right or wrong, but they're usually based off of uh, one study that was done in the 1960s on 20 beagles. And uh, we saw that like dogs who had under a certain level had a certain health outcome and dogs who had above that level had another health outcome. So we just said, okay, well, good enough. Um, we're going to like put this as the minimum standard and really no further research was probably done on that. And that, you know, it, it, it just shows that, um, you know, these aren't necessarily like really hardcore science backing these levels. The second thing here is, uh, there, there are things like minimum vitamin C requirements, uh, that like start to make this really controversial because dogs actually don't need any vitamin C in their diet. They can synthesize a hundred percent of the vitamin C that they need on their own without eating any outside vitamin C whatsoever. And the problem with this is that when you actually feed vitamin C to a dog, um, the way that it works molecularly in the, in their body is it actually binds to calcium and it's, it pulls calcium out of the bones. So it can actually cause, um, like bone problems and, and other, you know, related health issues just because we're feeding vitamin C and that's not even getting into the different types of vitamin C, you know, you're going to see like, you know, really synthetic forms in a lot of dog food. Um, another thing that uh, I've been starting to talk about a lot, and it's kind of like my current area of research it, because I, I've like really gotten on the bandwagon of synthetic vitamins and minerals aren't ideal for our dogs. And the reason that I believe that is because all of these studies, uh, really new ones, especially are starting to show that, you know, wet, whether it's vitamin D or it's, um, different different types of uh, like vitamin you know a you name it also minerals um i won't go into all of them right now but like all these different studies are being done right now and they show that like the body in both humans and dogs doesn't view uh those synthetic versions the same way as like that same vitamin that's coming from like, you know, organ meat or something like that. And so mm -hmm. there's, there's something there. People are talking about this a little bit in skincare, which obviously has nothing to do with pet health really. But, um, but the same thing, like when you look at actually like plant-based, um, plant-based topicals versus like animal-based topicals, um, they actually have different molecular shapes and, and the animal-based ones absorb in the skin. So like the skin mm -hmm. Uh, it is like very similar to organs in a lot of way. Like it, they're all just like the it's skin is an organ. organ. Yeah, mm -hmm. it, it, exactly. And so I think it's like a, a sign in addition to like lots and lots of studies that are showing the same thing in, you know, the kidneys and the heart and yeah. um, okay. the liver. I am going to stop you there because I do want to talk more about synthetic ingredients. Um, as, especially as it relates to the new product that you have coming out, because you just said, you know, this is something that you, you've recently become very passionate about. I do want to talk about it. I'm passionate about it as well. I, I just switched to a tallow face cream. Oh, so nice. like, I get it. Um, so yeah, it is absolutely that. And I just wanted to kind of interject that it is absolutely, even though we think, okay, human skincare has nothing to do with animals, but 
especially as a pet health coach, it actually is something I have to take into consideration because a lot of women, for instance, will use topical like estrogens and that can have an effect if it gets on your pet. Like it actually can have an effect on them because yeah. it's topical. You're putting it on your skin and then you're going and petting your dog, let's say, and your dog may, may just be really, really sensitive to these changes and fluctuations and hormones because, you know, all of our, basically all of our pets are spayed and neutered. And um, that in itself is, we're realizing causing more problems than <laughs> we ever could have imagined um, with their endocrine systems and their hormones going out of whack. But anyway, um, yeah, yes, I really, I, I really regret neutering my dog. I really wish that there could be more of him. And uh, I didn't think that, uh, or even think about it when I, when I got him, but, uh, yeah, that's yeah, like same. just a personal side quip, but, uh, yeah, I'm like, I kind of wish I hadn't done it for that reason alone, but it is interesting, right? Like, um, and I love that you take this holistic approach to your practice that, um, really is it, it's, it, it is science back to now, but it's also just bringing things back to basics. Like, you know, what, what did humans and dogs do in our past and looking at like even those diets, right? Mm -hmm. So with dogs, like I, you know, no, anyone who's ever met me knows I'm not a fan of the raw diet. However, um, I do think that there are things that we can take away from it that are really important. And, uh, the main thing being all the organ meats, like, you know, dogs can get a hundred percent of their daily vitamins and mineral needs, uh, simply by eating, you know, kind of like a nose to tail diet. So that's really where I've been moving yum wolf, especially with this new product that you alluded to, um, just a minute ago, perfect superfood, which we just launched this week. It's a very exciting time because, uh, these, this one, usually it just takes a year to formulate a dog food. Um, this, this product took us two years it, and, and boy, was it worth it. You know, it, it, um, you know, another thing is like, we have all these picky eaters that we see mm -hmm. and I'm, I, I just became convinced that a lot of these things that we do to, I mean, like, I don't know if you've ever tasted a vitamin and mineral mix on its own or just even smelled it, but it doesn't smell or taste good. It's like really, really gross. So I have come to the conclusion that like that is actually one of the biggest turnoffs to dogs for picky who are picky eaters. Whereas mm -hmm. like, you know, you look at a, a canine in the wild, um, the first thing they go for is the organ meats. Like it's, you know, very tasty to them. You know, um, I always joke with people if they ask, like, if I eat our food, which I, I do, I'm the first one to eat it. And, you know, I, I would say like, if you're, if you're into the organ meats, like it's also human grade, so you can, you can eat it. Um, it, and it is like <laughs> super healthy. <laughs> See, I don't like people can ask me all they want. I do not eat what I feed my dog. I am a very, very picky eater. I have a child's palate. So I take my organs in desiccated form. Smart. Oh man. I, not... I was cooking a lot of beef liver for a while, but that's just, ooh, that's a, a tough, uh, a tough habit to get yeah. on. Yeah. Uh, oh, absolutely. Um, so, okay. I have so many questions about fats. And you wrote the book on fats. So let, let's go, right? Um, the first thing I want to ask, okay, so there a number of years ago, a very popular blog posted an article and the whole healthy pet space went nuts because this particular blog suggested that coconut oil is actually bad for dogs. And I looked it up and they just updated the article in January, 2024, and they have not budged on their opinion. And I want to uh, tell, okay, tell me what you think about this <laughs> because oh, I think coconut oil is wonderful. I know the blog you're talking about too. And I've actually spoken with the person who runs it and she was originally for some people may know she was originally a fan of coconut oil and, and hardcore turned on it. Um, I'm still not quite sure why, because I have read literally every single uh, NIH study that's ever been done on dogs uh, pertaining to coconut oil and MCT oil. And uh, here's the outcome. Zero say that it's bad for dogs. Some show that it doesn't have an effect. And then uh, a lot of other studies show that it has a lot of health benefits. Um, it has probiotic-like effects. Um, 
It, uh, you know, is anti-inflammatory. And then what my book really dialed into is what I've called the Coco Mega effect. Um, in fact, I, I have a copy of the book here and, um, you know, the, this word Coco Mega talks about, uh, a really interesting new area of research that shows how combining coconut oil with omega-3s actually have synergistic effects on each other. So this whole idea of, like synergistic ingredients, I think is going to be a, a really interesting future area of study. Um, and, and this, this line, you know, I just kind of stumbled upon it and the research showed that it's kind of like a one plus one equals three type of effect. So when you combine these fats and your dog eats them at the same time, something is happening, uh, in their body that they're actually like, you know, doing some magic with each other. Um, and, and it, Ultimately, like all of these studies showed that it results in uh, additional anti-inflammatory effects. So, you know, for dogs who are having allergies or again, diabetes, obesity, um, you know, digestive issues are also like, you know, very inflammatory in nature. Um, it's just inflammation in different parts of the body, but basically, um, you know, I'm, I hope she changes her opinion someday because she's a very influential voice in the mm -hmm. pet community and uh, also a very powerful person in it, I would say. And a lot of people do follow her. So, you know, I, I think that most of the holistic type of people I speak to have come to the conclusion that it is good. Um, also just like naming off some of the, the common complaints about it. One is the the high saturated fat content. And uh, again, I've read every single study that deals with saturated fat in dogs. And, you know, for instance, in humans, I've also read many, many studies there. In humans, it does seem to have an effect on raising LDL cholesterol. So if like that's a concern for people, um, coconut oil is definitely not going to be ideal, but when it comes to dogs, every study that's ever been done on saturated fat shows that it had no negative effects on dogs. And it makes sense, right? Like they are carnivores in the wild. You know, people often talk about how, how they're more om omnivorous carnivores or, you know, kind of like selective carnivores on like cats. But I mean, you know, you can't, you can't go against the studies. They all show the same thing. So that was actually going to be my next question um, was about saturated fats, because I think for the most part, we think of the majority of the saturated fats that we get in our diet or that our pets get in their diet are going to come from animal sources with few exceptions in plants like coconut oil. So one of the things that I recently somewhat recently learned is that the myelin in the brain, the protect kind of like the protector in the brain is pretty much completely made up of saturated fat. And if we look back at when in humans, when we stop, when we, when our media possibly backed by government, I don't know. I didn't go down that rabbit hole because it's, it's, it's sad. <laughs> it's sad to I go did, down that rabbit I, I hole did, sometimes. It's fun. <laughs> um, but they, yeah, they demonized saturated fats, switched pretty much everything in our diets over to seed oils. Um, and yep. that's when we saw this huge, like influx of Alzheimer's and dementia and these brain related disorders. And it's, you know, that theorized and I see it that, you know, this lack of saturated fats in the diet has caused significant damage to the myelin in the brain, which is then not able to, you know, we can't, it's not functioning properly. It's not protected properly. And yeah. so I can kind of see how the combination of the saturated fats and the coconut oil in combination with saturated fats from animal products, like most omegas, I mean, we can get omegas from like marine life as well, but the, that how much more powerful it can be to combine them is that Am I on the right track? <laughs> oh, abs absolutely. The so you know you'll occasionally hear people half joke about how uh, seed oils were originally a, a mechanical lubricant, which is true. Yeah. Um, that doesn't mean that they're bad for bodies, uh, you know, just by itself. So uh, 
But the problem is, is that uh, seed oils are very high in omega-6. Um, omega-6 has a couple of really bad issues associated with it. So the first one is that it is um, pro-inflammatory. So in, in my book, I have a chapter with uh, a, a holistic vet who I've gotten to become really actually like friends with. We did a whole chapter together. Her name's Dr. Ava Frick. And, and we, we actually mapped out all of the chemical pathways associated with um, like omega sixes and omega threes, and you really got to get that balance right. I mean, that's the the fundamental takeaway there. So, like one of the pieces, one of the steps of the Coke Omega effect is getting those at at least a one to one ratio. If you look at pet food, and you probably know this, but a lot of people don't, so. Your typical high quality pet food is going to have a one to six omega three to six ratio. Um, that is, um, you know, definitely inflammatory. You know, if you look at your typical dry kibble, it's at one to sixteen, and that's the same as McDonald's and American fast food. Uh, Afco requires one to thirty levels uh, as kind of like a minimum, and they have. It's actually one of the hardest parts to f in formulating pet food is that you have to get to a certain level of omega-6 um, minimum. And so now you're trying to get the omega-3s up. Omega-3s also tend to cost more, so companies like typically don't want to add things like fish oil for for a lot of reasons, um, mostly cost. And um, you know that that's just really, really bad. Now, one, one way that we can counteract that is, of course, just adding like cod liver oil or salmon oil to our pet's diet or like feeding them a little bit of sardines uh, is kind of like a natural topper. Like the, these things aren't, aren't rocket science. Uh, just, we, you know, find sources of omega threes, feed them, uh, that can balance it out. But the, the bigger problem is that no matter how you cook pet food with the exception of probably air drying and freeze drying, even fresh cooking food, um, has this problem is that it does. And this is the second problem with omega sixes is that it does oxidize them. So getting back to the oxidized fats, that that's just like the number one offender in pet food. And so, you know, I'm always telling people that that's really the first step is um, getting that balance right, getting it one to one minimum. Uh, two to one is is probably going to be even better, as we can imagine. Um, and then just making sure that like those fats aren't getting oxidized. And so that that's where the the cooking method really plays a big role as well mm -hmm. um but the you know the seed, the seed oils i mean there there's a lot of also I, i'd say there's more research even being done in humans and we see more and more that you know they're not having a great effect um you know people talk about like expeller pressed uh seed oils and and that is going to be a little bit better like the the way that the seed oil itself is produced isn't oxidizing it, but then we're cooking it later and getting rid of like any benefit of expeller pressing. And that, that really just means cold pressing. So, you know, the, the seed oils are bad. Um, they're only in pet food. Uh, the, the way that this started is because some of these aforementioned brands like Hills and Purina who, uh, also tend to, if you look at the board seats and stuff of AFCO, tend to be on the board. Those ingredients uh, were only introduced into pet food because um, they weren't using real meat as the, mm -hmm. the top ingredient. So they had to then supplement more omega-6s. But there's a really easy alternative way to do it, of course, and that's just like make real meat the the number one ingredient, and then it's pretty easy to to reach your omega six requirements. Yeah, so I think that is something that most people do not understand about a lot of commercial pet foods, these high heat processed foods, um, and they and that is a huge problem. I think something that may be easier for people to understand is that, you know, they still, even once they get that end result product, they're like spraying them with palatants, which are often oils as well. And they're chemicals they really. Yeah. And they, they oxidize too. Yeah, and they, for sure. Like, it's, it's really kind of a nasty process all the way around, but they do have to do something to make it, appetizing <laughs> for our pets to eat I, i've uh, tried I think... to reach out to these palatin companies before because i I've, I've been like 
you know, with Perfect Kibble, um, our first and still number one bestseller, you know, it, it's all health food ingredients. And so, um, you know, Perfect Superfood, again, is like a raw diet, air dried. So it's like all the benefits of a raw dry diet, no synthetic vitamins and minerals, all the organ meats, and then air drying it kills the pathogens. So it's like the best of all worlds. But with Perfect Kibble, um, which is what we originally, um, that was our first product, you know, we, we have things like, uh, um, I mean like blueberries, like a lot of dog foods have that and flaxseed and, and, uh, and ingredients like that, that like we, we might eat and w it, it can be really hard to get picky eaters to get interested in that. So I started looking at, okay, like what are ways we ended up creating a, a, a topper called yum sauce. That's actually, um, it's actually more like Korean uh, barbecue inspired uh, flavors, but um, I was like, okay, well, like let's just see what these Palatin companies have to offer. And and I I ordered samples to my house. I mean, first off, they're they're always the same thing. They're like really salty yeast extract, and uh, yeast extract isn't like going to be a necessarily a bad ingredient in terms of longevity, but they just like don't really taste that good. And so, you know, basically, you know, pet food companies have found themselves in a place where they need to, they're using all these synthetic vitamins. They're using a lot of health ingredients that aren't attractive to dogs. Um, dogs just simply don't like them. And then we, we, you know, other brands coat with a palatin and, and it just, it really doesn't work. Um, so, you know, I think getting getting back to the basics like um and I, and I have all sorts of um like when pet parents come to me with a I I also have a picky eater that's like a big reason why I've been uh, exploring this so much so you know I I've been playing around with so many things and I I find pet parents just haven't tried enough things like um different from yeast extract is nutritional yeast very healthy ingredient high in B vitamins like all the good stuff mm -hmm. um that's a natural source of glutamic acid, which um, if you look at what MSG is, monosodium glutamate, that glutamate is the chemical form, the artificial form of glutamic acid. And what that does is that glutamic acids, like in meats, by the way, that's like, besides nutritional yeast, it's like probably the biggest source of it. So um, if we, and what it does is it lights up the brain. It, it, uh, it basically says like, yay. And, and so, you know, if we just top, you know, coat the, the food with nutritional yeast or um, if that, I mean, that works really well, but if that doesn't work, um, we can try things like bacon grease. Um, you know, people are like, oh, well this, is, I mean, I personally save my bacon grease for me as well. But, mm -hmm. you know, people have been, I think, scared away from it, um, which is really odd to me because if you look at actually the, even the saturated fat content of bacon grease, it's a lot less than other types of animal uh, fats. So, mm -hmm. but there are all these little things we can try using natural ingredients. Um, toasted sesame oil can be um, a really good way to kind of get a, entice a dog into eating. Um, I just think that like a lot of people you know, can try more things. And, um, you know, there, there are like natural ways of coating the food, but it, it does get back to basics. If the food actually tastes right, then more, your dog's more likely to, to enjoy it. Yeah. So the product, the new product that you, that you have coming or that is out now, just yes, launched, just launched it. That is what I'm like most excited to talk to you about. Um, because as we were talking about previously, you're kind of on this, this kick about synthetics and I, you know, it couldn't have come at a better time, um, because there is, there is an issue in pet food right now that the FDA has yet to acknowledge. Um, but there are thousands of pet parents who are complaining that their dogs and cats are getting very sick. Some are dying. Um, there are also humans that are getting sick. All of this presumed to be from pet food and, um, the FDA knows about it <laughs> and trying to pinpoint what is causing it is like looking for a needle in a haystack and specifically Dr. Judy Morgan kind of took this on. She felt obligated to because of the number of 
pet parents with complaints because of the severity of the complaints. Um, and it, it would be a lot easier if the FDA would actually step up and do something about it. But in the lack, you know, in, in the in the interim, hopefully it does happen, but at least in the interim, she's done a lot of testing to try to find out what it is. But unless you know what to test for, you're just throwing darts at who knows what, right? Like, um, so we don't really know what it is, but it is suspected to be some sort of dry ingredient that these pet food companies all get from the same place, which could be anything. And so um, synthetic ingredients have been kind of top the, the top of the list for potential issues with, with pet foods. Um, and again, we're seeing it in dogs and we're seeing it in cats. I don't think we're seeing it as much in cats because cats tend to eat more variety in their diet than dogs do. Um, I think people get dogs and they say, you know, they buy that, let's just say Purina Pro Plan off of the grocery store shelf and they never switch it up ever in their dog's life, which is a whole other story. And I want to scream and pull my hair out about that too. <laughs> but um, what is it about synthetic ingredients that has you on this like learning kick and wanting to change things up? Well, it really was start, you know, there are lots of people I follow that I respect who started talking about it. And that just led me on this deep dive of uh, actually looking into the research. Like I never trust anybody for their health advice. Like I, I always just do my own research and I, I try to exhaust every study that's out there until I form my opinion. And that's really where, that's really how it began is that is, I started seeing in all of these studies that um, the comparing the synthetic version of um, vitamin D is a really weird one. Like it doesn't make sense that like a synthetic version of vitamin D should be different than other forms, but it it did show that you know it has different uh, health outcomes in terms of heart disease. So there, you know, take the the supplement. Um, another thing that I I learned along the way that really was like an aha moment for me is I, when we were formulating our allergy and digestion toppers, um, we were deep diving into, we looked at, we basically put together a list of every holistic ingredient that's been purported to have health benefits by Eastern medicine or like ancient Greek medicine. And uh, we went through all of them and then we compared them to the NIH studies. And, and what we ended up finding is you know, let, let's just start on a very basic one. Um, choline. Choline is, um, you know, a very common supplement for both humans and dogs. It's uh, primarily recommended to aid the liver. So uh, if we look at what is the, you know, and, and again, the, when we think of synthetic forms, like these are like chiseled out of a rock. Um, they're not like from natural sources. So uh, when, when we look at choline, um, what is the highest bioavailable natural source of choline? It's the liver. Uh, so like eating liver meat helps the liver in both humans and dogs. Um, then I, I looked at, okay, like CoQ10. CoQ10, highly recommended for heart health. Um, okay, so like, let, what's the highest source of CoQ10? Uh, and I, I discovered that it's a uh, chicken heart and duck heart, um, beef mm. heart has a lot of it too. So it's heart, heart helps the heart. And so when we just feed, uh, all we really need to do instead of feeding these, uh, kind of like more man-made synthetic toppers or vitamins, we, we can actually just supplement more of that, um, you know, troubled organ in the diet, or if we're looking to prevent it, we can just feed, feed a dog that their whole life. And then. Um, the other problem with, um, you know, you mentioned people, uh, and my does Purina pro plan have a cult like following. I do not get it, but the, I definitely, I definitely know that Purina has trolls on Reddit that I am. Anytime we read you're on, like you're on Reddit and, um, someone talks about how bio, uh, bioavailable the proteins are. I mean, it's just like, nobody talks that way. That's how corporate pet food companies talk. Nobody else knows about that. So 
and bioavailability is great. It's just like um, kind of a talking point for uh, corporate dry kibble companies. So uh, it's like l- their only talking point, and it's not even a good one because uh, air drying is actually still more bioavailable than dry kibble. But mm-hmm. uh, off of that topic, you know, people um, will shop and and uh, and you know grab a, a Purina Pro Plan, and they just keep feeding their dog that or it could be Merrick or it could be honest kitchen. And they, we feed mm-hmm. our dogs the same protein, not only day after day, but year after year. And, um, it's no wonder why 15% of dogs are allergic to chicken. And now 15% of dogs are allergic to beef. So, um, that's kind of weird, right? Yeah. You know, chicken, maybe it makes sense. It's not, it's not necessarily like the biggest, uh, protein that, uh, wolves ate in their, in their ancestral diet. Beef is getting a lot closer. Um, and the fact that those stats are exactly the same, uh, for the top two, uh, proteins, everyone, everyone moved from chicken to beef, maybe over the last like 10 to 15, 10 to 20 years. So uh, now beef is just as common of an allergy. So whereas people tend to be really afraid of chicken, these poor chickens, everyone, everyone's singling them out, saying that their dog shouldn't eat chicken because chicken's a, um, you know, a high allergen protein. It's, it's, it's not that. It, it's that we feed our dogs the same thing day after day after day, and they build up a, an intolerance to it. So mm-hmm. that's why a rotational diet is is so important. That's the other thing that man, I've gotten really onto that one. And, you know, one of the, one of the big mistakes that, um, we made with perfect kibble is that we only had chicken and beef. So we, we only had the two highest allergen meats and, um, you know, in that, in that first version of perfect kibble, like the, the chicken recipe also had beef liver, which, which isn't a problem. And it's a small amount. I don't want to like scare people away from that, that nobody should be, but, the, the, the real pro the real thing here is like, I, I spent, um, over a year talking to pet parents on my nutrition calls, sending them the perfect superfood, our new product, the perfect superfood recipe. And I, and it's all hypoallergenic meats. So I would ask people like, can your dog eat at least one of these recipes? And, uh, believe it or not early on, the answer was no. Um, so that gets to the other thing in perfect kibble. We try to keep those recipes really the same, try to keep it like very, um, beside, you know, we just swapped out chicken and beef pretty much. And, and they were very much similar, but what I started uncovering is that, um, so many dogs were allergic to either flaxseed or carrots. Carrots is always going to be the one that's like the weirdest to me. I just still can't believe that so many dogs are allergic to carrots but I, I spoke to so many people who, and, and actually I was speaking to, um, Jen Schisler, who is, uh, in my opinion, the top, uh, dermatology expert for dogs. Um, she's also a veterinarian, really, really amazing person too. And, um, she, you know, what, what she believes it is, is actually like, uh, uh, cross sensitivities. So like if a dog is allergic to, um, one type of food group, but then carrots, like the small amount of proteins that are in carrots are molecularly similar enough to, um, what the dog is actually allergic to, it still causes a reaction. So, you know, we, you know, after a year, we really tried to make every recipe very different. Cause I was super set on everyone should be able to find at least one recipe that's going to work for their dog. So two out of three recipes are monoprotein, like they're single protein. You know, if you're, you know, the wild caught fish and the low fat Turkey. Um, the other thing about the low fat Turkey is like, I've been speaking to so many pet parents whose dogs have pancreatitis. Um, this actually might be, I don't know if I'm like, uh, just like attracting the, the, a small sector of the market, but I, I get the sense that it's actually a growing problem. So that's a, that's another really challenge. Talk about fats. I mean, um, schnauzers in particular, but like small breed dogs are, um, pretty much most at risk for pancreatitis. So they're typically recommended low fat diets. And, uh, so we, I was really set on like all of our recipes are fairly low fat. The low fat Turkey one is very low fat. So we also wanted to, in every recipe, try to address a different type of dog, if that makes sense. So perfect kibble like that, the levels of Coco Mega super fats in that one are about 10 times higher than in, um, in our, um, in our perfect superfood recipes. Um, 
So that's going to be good for like dogs who have environmental allergies, or it's going to uh, potentially help with like, uh, you know, really bad gut health issues. Um, you know, one of the things that's really beneficial about that level of coconut oil is that the lauric acid in it has a probiotic like effect. So um, it's basically an antibacterial uh, to some extent, a safe one, but it, it helped. So like when we talk about microbiome diversity, that first recipe was like completely formulated around these studies around microbiome diversity. And so there are two aspects to that statistic. And this is like anyone who's trying to understand how to fix their dog. Um, this is like something to look at. So the microbiome diversity, the first one is like that stat. It's um, just looking at like how diverse um, on and it and there there's actually like ways to test for this. How diverse are like the the healthy and unhealthy bacteria colonies in the gut? The problem is is that you can also have really high microbiome diversity, but be, be overrun with uh, you know clostridia. So uh, what is nice about the coconut oil and th this one I can't explain, but for some reason, the lauric acid targets the bad bacteria. So it opens up uh, the microbiome. It basically um, removes the pathogens and then allows that space to fill up. So that that's called the F to B ratio. That's getting into like the most forefront part of microbiome research. But uh, that ratio is showing um, basically the ratio between healthy and unhealthy bacteria. And so you want to get that higher, obviously. And so when you get those two ratios high together, that's where you have like really healthy microbiomes. And so um, that's why like, you know, the the first recipe is going to be good for a certain type of dog. But, you know, when we're dealing with dogs who maybe are more at risk of pancreatitis and need that low fat diet, then the question becomes, OK, well, how do you keep the recipes low carb? How do you also uh, get the protein up and the fats down and uh, get the right fats in there? Um and and uh, so in in perfect superfood, the the reason why I actually I'll probably still recommend it to dogs with digestive issues is because we literally just copied the levels that they used of uh, coconut oil and omega threes uh, as were done in these different research studies, and um, and they're all in my book. So um, that's the really interesting stuff. Is like it actually doesn't even take that much coconut oil. You know, 1% of the diet is really all you need um, to, to see these benefits. And uh, the probiotic-like effect is a really, really interesting one, in, in my opinion. Really important to do this over the first 18 months of a dog's life, too. Um, you know, with probiotics, and, and so let's not confuse probiotic-like effect with probiotics, but like probiotics, all the research shows that those have a long-term effect when they're fed uh, to both humans and dogs in the first 18 months of their life, and humans is three years. And then it also, so like you could stop feeding it at 18 months and the dog will be forever healthier. Um, after that, we need to feed it at least every three days, otherwise the probiotic uh, effects go away. Um, also later in life, they can once again, start to have more long-term effects. And they also have like a greater effect because, uh, dogs just really need more support at that stage in their life. Um, but it, it's really interesting stuff. So the, you know, I think all, everything we do is, is like really focusing on looking at healthy fats. You know, my book, the, the conclusions aren't going to surprise anyone, Oxidized seed oils are the worst thing that we can feed our dog. And uh, omega-3s, coconut oil, MCT oil, these are things that were unanimously shown to have uh, some level of benefit. Okay. Last question. And just so I understand, so the new product, it is Perfect Superfood. This is basically... Um, a whole food diet that is air dried. Exactly. There are no synthetics. Exactly. It is all real food. It is balanced to meet minimum AFCO requirements. So everybody can be comfortable and confident that their dogs are getting <laughs> the nutrients they need. The one thing 
And I just, I want to know what your thoughts are on this. The one thing from my point of view, I would say, please add is moisture. Do you recommend adding moisture to this food? That's going to be tough. Um, it actually is pretty, I, I actually love the consistency of moisture and, um, I think it's around 20%. Uh, it, it, that was one of the big challenges with our first product is, you know, water, AKA moisture, um, is the breeding ground for bacteria. So, um, creating a dry pet food that doesn't have it, like you, you have very limited options basically if, if you want to keep it shelf stable. So, um, you know, we, we also have like a DIY mix. If people want to make fresh food, um, that's like, so like 70 at, at serving time, you, you portion it out and then do you the, recommend adding? You can do it that way. The way I'll do it is I'll like actually cook. You just combine one bag with eight pounds of ground meat and I'll put it in two casserole dishes, put those in the oven at low temp, and then I'll meal prep it. I'll just divide it into three day portions and put some in the freezer, keep some in the fridge, like fre fresh foods, like always, yeah. always going to be great. Yeah. The, the problem is it's really hard to travel with. So, yeah. um, and, and sometimes you get lazy and you or busy and you, uh, don't want to cook. So. Uh, that that's where like perfect kibble hit for the last, um, however many years, three years has been, uh, more than, more than that has been like 30, the other 30% of my dog's diet. The, so when, when we're creating a dry dog food, like the thing people need to recognize is like, if you, if we want to go fresh and we want high moisture content, then, um, like basically you need to start adding glycerin and natural flavor preservatives. Um, they are low grade preservatives. Um, they're like amino acid type things, but, uh, still like who really wants that? Right. Like, uh, mm -hmm. for instance, uh, any, any time that you see a natural flavor in a food, you should assume that it's a preservative. It's not to make mm -hmm. it tasty. Right. So it might also be that, but so first, uh, these natural acids are, uh, natural flavors are like uh, cultured extracts that sometimes they're called that, uh, fermentation extracts, but they're a low grade natural preservative. And with, you have to keep the water activity level. Uh, that's like a, definitely a topic that, um, most people are never going to care about, but, um, you know, basically, um, you know, anytime you have a water molecule, it has to be, uh, bound with some other molecule. So that's where the glycerin comes in. Like, uh, water will combine with glycerin and, uh, glycerin is called a humectant. So, um, when, when they combine with each other, that, that makes that water molecule no longer able to, uh, that, ma that means the bacteria it's like taken, uh, it, it, uh, bacteria can't get in there. So glycerin is an interesting ingredient common in like a lot of health food bars for humans. And this is the same reason why. Again, I've read every single research on glycerin. So um, the short story on that one is it's it's completely neutral. It's pure calories. It has uh, no negative health benefit health effects. Um, it may actually have positive effects for dogs with epilepsy. I'll actually go into that one in a second. Uh, but it has no negative effects on dogs, but at the same time, it provides no nutrients. Uh, it has no vitamins, minerals, etc. So it's just pure calories and it's keeping the food shelf stable. So, mm -hmm. you know, that's why it's so common, but it's like not a desirable ingredient. Um, also to make a food soft and chewy, um, you know, that, that at least that moisture look, I'll call it. Um, it also adds like this shine to it. And it, again, it makes it like a really nice texture. So from like a manufacturing standpoint, this ingredient makes a lot of sense to use. That's why it's very common in, in a lot of, uh, you'll see it in like, you know, perfect superfood doesn't have it. I was like very adamant about that. Um, no, no glycerin, no natural flavors, no synthetic vitamins, minerals, but that's why it's so common in other, uh, air dried foods. Um, with the dogs with epilepsy real quick. So, um, that's where you really want a higher fat diet, um, because we can balance between three things, essentially carbohydrates, fats, and proteins. I'll also throw fiber in there, but that's a type of carbohydrate. So we want to, for dogs with epilepsy, we want a low carb diet because, um, glucose is going to, um, tend to trigger epilepsy more. 
um, we protein's good, uh, and then fat, um, you want, so like we've kept the carbs down, so we can only play with protein and fat now. So like upping the fat, um, to at least a, the one-to-one -one ratio that you'll see in perfect kibble is what like a holistic vet would recommend in addition to the MCT oils, which are going to have a benefit in terms of like, they're going to be turned straight into ketones. So they're bypassing that energy pathway. And then the glycerin, you know, if, if like, let's, let's just say that, um, you know, again, you're trying this balance. So like glycerin's like the fourth. So you have proteins, fats, uh, carbs, and actually glycerin is like a fourth, uh, macronutrient. Uh, it's not any of the others. And so, uh, that's one where it also, uh, uh, when you look at the energy pathways in the canine body, it'll actually, uh, bypass the glucose related ones and it'll, uh, essentially create another source of energy, uh, for the dog that isn't going to trigger, um, trigger epilepsy. Now, uh, you want it to be mixed in the food. Uh, I, I kind of don't dare anyone listening to go buy, um, you know, food grade glycerin and try a teaspoon of it yourself. But if you do that, it is not pleasant. Uh, it's no. a little sweet. That's the good part, but it is like, it's, it's like, it'll, it'll cause a little bit of a reaction. It's really hard to take down. So, um, be careful giving, like, don't use it as a topper on your dog's food is what I'm saying. But, okay. um, <laughs> but, uh, it can be part of a diet for epilepsy. Um, Generally speaking, though, um, it's something we want to avoid. Like, um, you know, we want to stick to like more natural things. So for people who want more like moisture in their food, I still think like bone broth and water is like the way to go. Yeah. But um, yeah, that was like that was a big part of it because we definitely didn't want our food to look like dry kibble or have that same kind of like you know, there you're getting like five to 10% moisture content and it's like definitely not ideal. So, you know, we, uh, we were able to kind of manage all these things together, keep the water activity level down, but that that's, you know, that is, um, not, not an easy thing to do. And that, that's why this product took two years to formulate because there were just like all of my little perfectionist things. And, you know, then after speaking to pet parents with, you know, dogs again have like the most random allergies blueberries okay we need a blueberry free recipe like who would have guessed that and so you know we we just um kind of really tried to create that diversity and um you know if if anyone anyone can't tell by now i'm like a little bit of a perfectionist so we um you know we just really like tried to dial it in there and get also make it slightly cheaper than perfect kibble was like that was also another challenge for us like you know, just using like premium ingredients, like coconut oil is not cheap. And, um, and so, you know, we were able to also achieve, um, you know, achieve a little bit lower of a price point there too. So perfect superfoods, the best I'm super obsessed with it, honestly. Um, it, uh, it just arrived, uh, to our house and I started feeding it to our dog and, um, you know, the, the like final version of it in our first production run, and it's, uh, it, and of course, like I was the first taste tester too. So it, it tastes really good. The, um, I would say like the fish recipe, the, the meat lovers has been our number one seller. That's like a combo of different meats. Um, it has like wild caught fish in it. It has, um, turkey. And uh, when I say turkey, like all the turkey and it has um also like duck liver so it's kind of like feeding your dog a little bit of foie gras in there which is kind of neat <laughs> <laughs> we like to get bougie over here bougie. <laughs> awesome so okay i think you know as i was saying at the very beginning um we need to be able to meet people where they're at but also provide them with the healthiest options available um, and when people are, especially if they're in this transition period where they're like, you know, they, they, they're in this dogma where we feed the food that we buy in the bag off of the shelf. And that's what our dogs are supposed to eat for so, so, so long. And we're trying to move people over, you know, having something that is just as convenient, but we're giving them a whole food diet with no synthetics and it is not high heat processed and like that that's important it's important that people know that this is something that is now available 
um, because we we do want people to feel like this this type of feeding is accessible to them. It's not, you know, not everybody has the time or um, the even wants to, you know, spend in sourcing all these different ingredients and meal prepping for their animals. Like that's a commitment. And I know I'm not in that boat. I wish I was in that boat, but I'm not. It's not, I'm not in that season of life right now where I'm sourcing ingredients and meal prep. I don't even meal prep for myself. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it, thank you for, um, continuing to dig into the research and insisting that it is all whole food uh, nutrients, there are no synthetics, and we're getting the absolute best nutrition to our pets in the most convenient way. I appreciate that. Thank you so much. Yeah, it, it's a, a real passion for me. I got into this because I'm passionate about it. And, uh, you know, any it, starting a business is never easy. Um, but that's like what kind of carries you through is just like that passion. And, you know, it, my, my only request to anyone listening here who's still feeding dry kibble is please stop feeding your dog dry kibble. Um, like I said, the oxidized, the oxidized fats are, are really bad for your dog. And, um, you know, in, in addition to that, like some, sometimes people are, are, I understand like a lot of people are, are, uh, balling on a budget these days, but paying $20 more a month for dog food, or it could be more than that. But like, I, I often see people don't want to pay like $20 more. And you think about the savings long-term that this can have in terms of health vet bills. Um, you know, I, I still meet so many people who, you know, will, will say like, Oh yeah, my dog's getting up there in age. And I'll, I'll ask them, well, how old's your dog? Eight years old. I'm like, your dog is not old, dude. So, <laughs> no. <laughs> so, so, you know, and, and they're always feeding the usual suspects of dry kibble, yeah. the mega, mega corporation ones. Yeah. So, you know, the, the little, these little foundational things getting over the need to like totally optimize and pay like the dollar per calorie lowest amount is never the way to go. Um, there are other online brands out there that we compete against that are 50% carbs. They look, people think they have healthy ingredients most of those healthy ingredients are on our never list. Like the mm -hmm. peas, we didn't get into peas, rice, legumes, potatoes today, but those are like hardcore on our never list. Very, very common filler ingredients in pet food. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, those are other things to really watch out for. Like I, sus I suspect that dogs are actually um, more, um, there, there isn't any science behind this one, by the way. It's just like, I personally suspect that dogs are, are more intolerant to lectins than humans are. So, uh, and they really didn't eat them in the wild either. So, um, you know, that a lot of these ingredients that I, you know, the, the peas and the legumes are like super, super high in lectins that they became really popular when people originally were moving from grain free to, or grain to grain free dog food, like mm -hmm. 25 years ago. Um, but they're just not good for dogs. So, you know, uh, my, my main point is like, you know, go going up a level, paying a little bit more, like nobody wants to pay more just because, but it's not just because like it really does like everyone who switches from dry kibble 30 days later, their dog is looking healthier and skin is just the, the final expression of what's happening on the inside. Absolutely. Thank you so much for that. And I think we'll just go ahead and end on that note because it, it, it is an important one. It's convenience and it's cost. And I always tell people it's either you're either going to pay more or you're going to spend more time on it. And you got to decide one way or the other. Do you want to put time into it? Do you want to put money into it? And that's a decision you have to make and find, you know, find that balance for you. What's going to work better for you? Because if you're going to make your own food at home, that's great. That's wonderful. You're going to have to put the time into it. <laughs> but Absolutely. If you don't have the time, then you're going to have to put the money into it. So, and that's, that goes for everything in life. It's either time or money one or the other and you always have to make that decision so well said <laughs> <laughs> so uh thank you again and where can people find um where can pe people find you where can they find perfect superfood yeah i'm i'm personally jaron lucas with a k on instagram yum wolf despite uh common misconception is not yum wolf it's uh, actually yum wolf 
<laughs> and uh, you can find us at yumwoof.com. And um, yeah, like, you know, our customer support team and myself are all like very, very accessible. So don't hesitate to reach out to us with the weirdest allergies ever. Awesome. Thank you so much. And everybody have a fantastic day. I will talk to you next week.